Reading from 1 Peter chapter 5, Contemporary English Version. Church leaders, I am writing to encourage you. I too am a leader, as well as a witness to Christ's suffering. And I will share in his glory when it is shown to us. Just as shepherds watch over their sheep, you must watch over everyone God has placed in your care. Do it willingly in order to please God, and not simply because you think you must. Let it be something you want to do instead of something you are merely doing to make money. Don't be bossy to those people who are in your care, but set an example for them. Then when Christ, the chief shepherd, returns, then you will be given a crown that will never lose its glory. All of you young people should obey your elders. In fact, everyone should be humble towards everyone else. The scriptures say, God opposes proud people, but he helps everyone who is humble. Be humble in the presence of God's mighty power, and he will honor you when the time comes. God cares for you, so turn all your worries over to him. Be on your guard and stay awake. Your enemy, the devil, is like a roaring lion. He's sneaking around to find someone to attack. But you must resist the devil and stay strong in your faith. You know that all over the world, the Lord's followers are suffering just as you are. But God shows under undeserved kindness to everyone. That's why he appointed Christ Jesus to choose you to share in his eternal glory. You will suffer for a while, but God will make you complete, steady, strong, and firm. God will be in control forever. Amen. Taking the, taking the title of this uh, message from the first verse of the fifth chapter of Peter. Peter concludes his epistle with an, a request for the elders. So I thought, let's just see what Peter is asking the elders to do, especially on a night of ordination. I pondered on this a little bit, and the first thing that Peter wants an elder to do is to be a shepherd. And a shepherd is uh, is supposed to take care of the sheep, right? I don't know about y'all, but I've always been told that sheep are stupid. That is the reason I heard the call to ordain ministry. (laughs) Is not to be assigned among the sheep because the sheep are stupid. And us elders, since we have all knowledge of all things, (laughs) and we are going on to perfection know how to take care of the sheep, don't we? Amen. You, you know my prayer for the last year for this message. It hadn't gotten any clearer, but uh, so help us, Jesus, especially me right now. I had a friend that I grew up with whose name was Robert, and he... He was not the brightest and the sharpest pencil because he raised sheep. The real men raised 
cattle, steers for stock shows and stuff, and the wannabes raised pigs. And I was a wannabe for one year. And I raised my pig, which was the stupidest animal in the world, <laughs> next to, of course, a sheep. And my pig, in all of its wisdom, got sick 10 days before the stock show and didn't make the sale. I lost $20 on that pig. <laughs> and I've never forgotten it since. Well, my friend Robert was not very smart, as I say. He was a sheep guy, and so he had a lamb. And lambs are even stupider than pigs. And his lamb was a beautiful animal. It was set to be the grand champion lamb of the show that year. And you know what that stupid lamb did? It got in a fight with somebody else, and it must have used its mouth to call him a non-pulpit quality word, don't you know? <laughs> and that other lamb just off and kicked him in the mouth and knocked his teeth out. And so if you know anything about a stock show for stupid lambs who get in stupid fights and lose their stupid teeth, he's disqualified. And so my friend lost more than $20 on his lamb. Made me feel real good about my pig. <laughs> and every farmer congratulated me on how well I had done raising that pig. That was it for me, though. So I went into the lamb business. <laughs> but I'm smarter than I look. It was called the church. And all along, haven't we been told how stupid the people we serve are? With this image, what an insult that is to the people, the souls that we've been called to tend. Do you know, I, lady, do have one thing in common with show lambs. They like to fight and they get their teeth kicked out sometimes. And I'm convinced that people come to church today because they've just got their teeth knocked out. They've taken hits to the gut and their life is upside down and they're wondering where in the world is God and they're coming into our church or really they're tuning in online because it's too big a risk. You don't want to walk in when you got your front ones knocked out to lose the back ones too. But we're looking for somebody that cares. And so we are being, have been, and are being ordained or commissioned or licensed not to serve a bunch of dumb people because I guarantee you the laity are smarter than we are clergy. If you don't believe it, just ask. And... <laughs> Unless you're married to a clergy couple, you can ask your spouse, and that will be confirmed. We're sent into the world to shepherd. What is shepherding? I want to just give you three letters. Each letter stands for a word. This is real quick, because this is not my main point tonight, to y'all's dismay. A shepherding visit consists of three simple things. Number one is to listen. Listen to people where they are. Don't try to fix them. Don't try to give them advice. Listen. Encourage. 
and bless. If we do those three things to the people who've gotten kicked in the mouth, we listen, we encourage, we bless. We go a long way toward caring for the flock that we've been entrusted to serve. I don't know why all of these uh, passages talk about humility in them when they're talking about clergy. So it's with great pride I want to talk about this next uh, piece. I am filled to the brim and say to all of y'all who need it, clothe yourself in humility or clothe yourself with humility toward each other. I started ministry in the golden age, and the golden age meant it was the golden age of preacher meetings. And the golden age is when you would go to the meeting and say, I had X number come, new members or new baptisms or new stuff like that, all of that stuff, and it was, can we one-up each other? And I was on the tail end of that. In fact, the people had suffered through those before, had just about had enough of it. And everybody was so depressed. And we quit having preachers meetings for a while, or at least uh, to to brag about how well we were doing. My first year ministry, the bishop decided that we would have a forced pulpit exchange. Have you ever had one of those? Where you got to go preach at your neighbor's church. Well, I liked that because I was the best preacher in the conference. And not seeing my gifts and graces, the the bishop had assigned me to the smallest church in the conference. (laughs) So I was really lucky. And I went to the neighboring town that day thinking to myself, this ought to be a piece of cake. This guy's just an associate member. (laughs) He's old. What does he know? (laughs) I was 24, by the way. I had hair up here and down here both. (laughs) And I preached what must have been, because all of them were, a great sermon. And I knew the next week, my church, I would go back in and they would be saying, oh, we're so glad you're back. We couldn't stand that other guy. And I could just hear it, even though it was 25 miles away at the next town and the next church. I could just hear them grumbling because they had to listen to Mr. Boring Guy instead of getting to listen to me. You know, the sad thing is I never thought of any of that stuff <laughs> until I got to the point in this, less, this message that I said, Lord, talk to me about where I've been ignorant in my ministry and missed the opportunity to be a humble servant because I was full of myself. Next year I'll be in ministry 40 years, so it only took 38. That's how long that guy sitting by the pool who was sick took. My mentor in humility is a guy named Bernard of Clairvaux. He's been dead about 800 years. It's safe to talk to him. He wrote a book called The Steps of Humility. And whoever did the edition that that I was reading at the time, I think I picked up a newer edition of it, but anyway, he talked about Bernard's steps of humility as a way of seeking God through love of neighbor. I thought, my goodness, that sounds like John Wesley. And I think it is. It contains 12 steps. No accident, it's 12 steps. How many of us are stuck in our addictions and our compulsions? We all are. Every day's a new day. We have a new day today. We're not worried about 10 years tomorrow. We're not worried about yesterday. It's today the day where I'm walking the line with Christ. Just today. 
12 steps. Six of them deal with interpersonal relationships. Four deal with authority. Those are the ones I wanted to talk to you all about tonight. And two, dealing with relationship with God. I'm not talking about authority tonight, of course. But the six, the first three deal with interpersonal relationships. And I just want to leave you with really the point of it. The first step of humility is to stay within yourself. I cannot tell you the number of times when I felt so competent to step outside of what I knew could be done thinking, oh, I can do that. I can do anything. The first step, really the first warning sign, is when I become so assured that I think I'm self-sufficient. I've got to stay within myself, recognizing my limitations as well as gifts and graces. And staying within myself means centering in Christ and the strength of the Spirit rather than I think I can add this to my calendar. I added something to my calendar today. I committed a sin because I brought my calendar to annual conference. And I even said, oh, I've got that. I don't remember what I wrote down in it, so if it was you that talked to me, I know it's in there. (laughs) Stay within Don't try to be more than you are. You're enough. You're enough. The second step is don't confuse. Now, I've edited this one a little bit. I've methodized it a little bit. Don't confuse going on to perfection with the pursuit of excellence. We can be excellent and still be going on toward perfection, but excellence and perfection are not the same thing. Perfection is something we pursue because we pursue the holiness of God. Excellence is something we perform Because we're doing our very best. Why are we called into ministry? To pursue God or to perform? Here's a quote from Bernard. For the love of one's own excellence makes a person both grieve to be surpassed And rejoice to surpass others. When we pursue excellence, we're going to pass somebody else in Oklahoma in the left-hand lane. (laughs) Now, if you want to pass on the right, go to Texas. They don't care down there. (laughs) Oklahoma, you better stay in the left-hand lane. Thank you, Lord. I better move on because I'm entertaining myself way too much here. The third step, Bernard calls foolish mirth. And I thought that was just horsing around. But foolish mirth is really much more than that. It's about looking at ourselves and telling ourselves what's really important without really saying it. (laughs) Here's a quote. And I put it in terms of me. Uh, Bernard talks about you and y'all, but I actually, I don't don't need to tell y'all this. I've got to remind myself of it. 
I do foolish mirth when I take careful notice of that which I seem that when I notice that which seems to make me look better, but I always overlook that which seems to make you look better. It's almost uh, the opposite of I can see your faults, but I can't see mine. I'm going to see my good, but I can't see yours. And there's a so that at the end of Bernard's statement. So that I can avoid anything unpleasant. I only want to look at my strengths and, my, and the places I'm stronger than you. And look at a gr- group like this, I'm not stronger than anybody else. But I, but I can convince myself of that. I can convince myself of that because I want, I want pleasant things and not unpleasant things. A few years ago, it hit me as I was reading and reflecting on the Beatitudes and came across the one that said, Blessed are the peacemakers. And I realized that I always wanted to add something that's not there. I wanted to add the phrase, blessed are the peacemakers because they will feel peace. That's not what it says. One of the hard lessons of ministry is that when we engage in the ministry of peacemaking, we don't feel peace. We embody In many times, the very conflict. Have we not felt that? Since February, we are embodying the conflict, the tearing of each other. And the more we seek to make peace, the less peace we have. Blessed are the peacemakers because they're going to feel peace. No No. What does it say? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will see God. Humility is nothing more than asking to see God. Peter ends with the statement that the God of all grace is going to give us four things. Boy, wouldn't that be four more great points? We wouldn't have time to ordain all of y'all. I asked last year and didn't get any volunteers, but would anybody like to wait till next year so I could give you all four of these points? (laughs) We didn't have any takers then either, but uh, if you would, all in favor say aye, you know, and all opposed, same sign. No, this is it. We're all at different places in ministry and life. And we get at different, different, you know, our spiritual lives, our bodies, our brains, our relationships all go through ups and downs. I mean, it really does. Just telling you the truth, or maybe I'm the only one. You know, if I'm the only one, y'all just say, let us pray, and we'll go on. Uh, But Peter promises four things that God's going to do with us, and I just want to name them. God will be with you to restore you. Sometimes we need to be restored because we mess up mightily. Sometimes nobody sees our mess up, and we need to be restored even more. The God of all grace will empower you. When you feel powerless. The very time where we think I cannot do this in my own strength. 
is the very time if we open our hearts that God will empower us. God will strengthen you when we get weak. There will be days and times that we will not feel we can go on. And yet, and yet, and yet, the strength of God will be yours. And finally, the last one that I've never saw before this. God will establish you. I probably would have thought I was established a long time ago. Now I'm looking at that as something ahead. It's kind of like going on to perfection. One of these days, when I feel like I haven't done anything that matters to anybody, that'll be the day, that'll be the time, that will be the grace when God says, I establish you on this legacy of life and ministry. I pray that for you. I pray that for me. I don't mind telling you. I pray that for all of us. Come, Holy Spirit. Renew your church. And I pray for these who come tonight that you will restore them at points in their soul where they need to be restored. Empower them where they feel weak. Strengthen them where they feel inadequate. And establish us, O God, not as a stale institution, but as a living part of the body of Christ. Thank you, Lord. In the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.